Yeah, so when I was thinking about what like a good presentation would be for this, because um, in the past I'd done, I'd done some demos and it's like, those are great, but like right now there is like so much going on with like, we're getting near the end of repotting season and now like trees are starting to grow. So I know like depending on where you are, I, I'm sure like the guys up in Wyoming, you know, uh, Dan and them, they're probably a little further behind here. Like stuff is just, it's starting to move. And then, you know, we're going to get this cold snap. So, so there's a lot of things that are, are going on. And so last year when COVID hit, I was actually um, able to, let me quit Chrome. Um, I was able to stay home a lot more, which actually allowed me to do a lot um, like pre-flush pruning, which I hadn't been able to do in the past. And so that was something where it's like, well, let's, let's concentrate on that. But because when utilized, like you can really set your, set your trees up like for this coming year. And then like, we'll like too, we'll talk about like by doing it this year, then it actually helps in perpetuation for next year as well. Okay. So let me, um, let me share my screen here. All right. So here, so, so for this talk, here's a, this is a blue spruce. Okay. But before, like we talk about like the pre flush pruning and then the like seasonal work right now. And like anyone can like talk and, you know, it's like, I'd kind of like this to have a, a conversation, but like where we are right now, it's May 11th. Right. So it's like, what are things that we're doing now? And what is important to be doing right now for our trees? Anyone? Like what's one of the biggest things we should be doing? What are you talking about re like repotting at this season, yeah. you mean? I mean, but it's it's done. So after yeah. like repotting is kind of, we're, we're at that tail end, right? So then moving into where trees are going to start to grow, like what is something we should be doing right now? Uh, in development, back. fertilizing. Who yeah. said that? Fertilizing? Rennie. Yeah, so fertilizing right now is really important, okay? So I just wanted to like preface this pre-flush pruning with like, what could we be doing right now? So fertilizing is really important. The only things that I'm not fertilizing are ponderosas that are in, uh, like are ramified ponderosas that are still being developed. I'm not fertilizing and I'm not fertilizing junipers either, right? So it's like, I'm gonna wait on junipers and I'm just kind of letting junipers do their thing because as they get like this big flush of growth and all this energy moving, if we're, like for one, junipers are a lot of work. And so if we just pump them full of, full of fertilizer, they're gonna push even more and they're a little harder to control. So it's like backing off on junipers, I'm not fertilizing junipers, I'm not fertilizing ponderosas, okay? But everything else, and like right now it's freezing, right? It's gonna freeze probably tonight um, or it's gonna be close, but then this weekend it's gonna be in the 80s, right? So then something else that we need to look at is, and it's been raining for three days and then we're getting heat. So then what does that happen? What happens with that? Water and then- the trees. What's that? Stress the trees possibly from the extreme temperature changes? No, I don't think it's that. I, I worry more about Old. fungal issues, mm. right? And so here we're lucky. We're lucky because it's fairly arid, but I have been finding more uh, Phomopsis and some needle cast, okay? Dothostroma on trees. So I've been um, proactively spraying. So this weekend I'll start spraying. I haven't sprayed up to this point, but I will start spraying this weekend with uh, Mancozeb for like the spruces, um, basically everything but pines and deciduous. I won't spray any of the deciduous, but I'll be spraying with Mancozeb all, this, all the spruces, um, like Engelmann's blues. Um, I'll spray junipers with that. I'll spray Douglas fir with that. And then when I spray the, uh, 
the pines I'll spray with Dacanil. Okay, so that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm gonna do and I'm just spraying proactively, okay? So that's something to just think about. We, I hadn't done it in the past, but last year I saw uh, more fungal issues than I had in the past. And so I'm just proactively doing that, okay? Hey, Todd. Yes. Are, are you spraying the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, Ponderosa, the emerging needles um, with, with the Dacanil. Dacanil? Yeah. Are you doing that as they emerge? Yeah. So okay. I say that because I have Dacanil. I spray them with Dacanil, but also last year I did a test where I sprayed everything with Mancozeb and there weren't, so for pines, it's like copper or, um, copper or Dacanil, and I sprayed them with Mancozeb, and I didn't see any ill effects, but I know like tried and true, um, Dacanil is a good one for Dothostroma. And so like as those needles emerge, I mean, it's for all pines, as the needles emerge, it's just something I'm gonna start doing, okay? So sorry to interrupt, what is the spraying schedule that you use once a week, less frequently? So it's every uh, seven to 10 days. So that's kind of like what in my head, like what's coming, you know, and and what are we going to start seeing? Okay. And so that's part of the seasonal work right now. Okay. But before trees start growing, and I was able, like I said before, I was able to do this last year, was a lot of pre flush pruning. Whereas in the past, I was gone the entire time where pre flush pruning is, um, is very helpful. And so, like, once the tree starts putting, putting out shoots of needles or like buds, um, like you've kind of missed, you've kind of missed that window, okay? So, but before that is a great time to come in. You can wire, you can remove wire, you can remove structural branches. And so that's kind of where it's like taking a tree and really setting it up for the following year. That's where this whole pre-flush pruning uh, comes into play. So this tree here, this is a blue spruce. It was wired, I don't know, 2017 by students from Albuquerque. And so they came up, wired it, I repotted it the following year. And then, um, then there was like this neglect basically is what happened, okay? So I basically just set the tree like away and just let it, let it do its thing. And, um, so I call that like controlled neglect. That's that's my little my little tagline, right? It's neglected, but it's a controlled neglect. So I just let it go. So this is what it looked like. So then the first thing that I decided to do, I cut all the wire off, okay? And so, oh yeah, so the pre-flush pruning, this is good for like we were talking before, firs, larch. I don't know if you have anyone has the larch here. Um, but now, like before they push is a great time, short needle, single flush pine, spots pine, so pinion pine. Um, yeah, pinion pine is still like that outlier that we're still figuring out and we can talk about that too, like later, like once they start growing and like pinching, because I've been pinching pinion pines. Um, bristlecone pine, deciduous, right? So right now too with deciduous, if you, like making big cuts on deciduous trees as I've been accumulating like trees over the last couple of years, I've been accumulating more deciduous. And so there's like a fall time and there's a spring time. And so right now I have found that when, when you do big cuts on deciduous trees, the heel, like it heals better than if you do it in the fall over winter. Cause here maybe our winters are colder, they're longer. And so I get more like dieback. Whereas if you do that, that cutting in uh, the springtime, they seem to respond better, okay? Also now like pinching, um, pinching deciduous is a good thing, right? Because like Japanese maples are growing, I have ammer maples that are growing and all those as they're putting shoots out, I'm pinching those, okay? So that's still part of the, part of the like what I am doing right now, okay? But when we go to pre-flush, okay, so that's it. Pre-flush, the first thing I'm doing, like after I remove, um, like removing like old wires, 
wires that are biting in, I, I'm removing that, then I'm taking out big structural flaws. So as you can see, like this right here, this is a huge branch in the middle. And this is a like a better branch off to the side and a better branch off to the side there, okay? So I cut that out, right? So I moved this big structural branch. And then here's another structural branch in there, okay? So this one's in the middle. This is a good branch. This is a smaller branch. And so too, when I'm doing this structural removal, I'm thinking about design in my head, okay? So if I removed like this smaller one, it's small, it's in, like it's it's in the crotch, but also if you if you remove that, then that big structural piece that we left, this right here, you can see where it's where it emerges on that trunk, and you want to hide that. And so that's one thing I've noticed. Like with with this, you want to hide where that branch emerges. So what I did is I left this smaller branch, okay, left that to kind of hide. And, and I'll make a pad out of this, hide where this branch here is emerging, okay? Does that make sense? So when you're doing it, it's like removing structural flaws for, for design, but also it's like thinking, removing it for asymmetry, okay? So here, down here, is the blue spruce originally, right? That's how it was. And then here, you can see I've removed some, some major branches. So here we removed a big structural branch. Here we removed a structural branch. We removed some structural branches down here as well. And so I did that because as I tilted the tree, it's like, this is fairly masculine, but I still want to have some form of asymmetry, okay? So I removed, some of these branches that if you look at the original, the original image, right? These structural branches gave a very kind of symmetrical look to the tree. And so I removed that to help give some sort of asymmetry, okay? Todd, I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, taking half a step back, where yeah. you removed that middle branch that was in the crotch and yeah. you, you said that the purpose um, for that smaller branch in the front is to hide where the larger of the two branches emerges from the from the trunk yeah. or that may be a secondary branch i'm not sure but did you want to did you want to hide the scar left by the removal of the middle one or you just didn't like the, the angle at which this remaining branch comes out of the trunk what was the reason that you wanted to hide that yeah so what i did is i i don't mind where i like remove the branch cuz that'll heal over that's not a big deal i don't mind because this branch like the branch that I left goes up first and then down, and it has a nice angle coming down. It's like, I don't mind that either. What I did is I didn't wanna see this area right here, right there where the branch emerges and is attached to this trunk, secondary trunk. I wanted to remove that, or I wanted to hide that. Okay, so it's the directionality of where it comes out from the, from the trunk there. Correct. Got it, thank you. Yep. Let me see if I can, if this still works. I had a question real quick following up yeah. on that uh, with the pruning. With your styling initially, um, I see your videos within your styling. How do you initially get to that point of knowing where you want to cut style you want to go in with the idea of already having it? On the, sorry, you, as you're you cutting out with the, like, how do I get to this point from the initial styling? Yeah, yeah. Within your first initial styling, how do you set your tone for how you want the tree to look? Because what we saw with the before picture was the very, you know, dome-like uh, aspect of a traditional tree. And then you went for this way as more asymmetry. How did you choose to go from there with the pruning? And does that make sense? Yes, it does. So, okay. I mean, I think a lot of that is just, it's personal growth to be honest, you know, it's like from, so like over when I started doing this in 2017, so this is my fifth year, it's like the way I approach trees has changed, the way I look at trees has changed, the way I want to design trees has changed, you know, all that in, in the five years after you start seeing it, you, you don't get into like, this is how I design them, but certain trees you start seeing a different way. Whereas before, 
like with a tree like this, it's very symmetrical. It's wide. Part of that is because we designed it and then I let it grow for 2017, four years. And so trees revert back to symmetry, right? And so that's why you have to keep working. If you let a tree just grow, it reverts back to symmetry. So by coming in, and that's part of the thing too, it's like you lay a tree out, but eventually like branches get removed, branches like get stronger, some get weaker, you know? So it's like this whole kind of shift and, and uh, interaction interaction with the trees. And so, but part of this too, it's like, this is whatever this version was. And I was looking for a before picture and I couldn't find one. So, but whatever this picture is now, like my picture in my head now for a tree like this is more like Alpine. You know, and it's like more asymmetrical, more instead of a more formal upright, now it's more asymmetrical um, alpine alpine view. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's part of it. So it's like pruning for asymmetry. So that's what I did, you know, and so then after that, it's like, okay. Now let's just set the structure of this tree, okay? And so, so this is the tree. This is the tree after the after the structure set, okay? So it's like, all right, these are the branches I'll use. Probably not all the length, but those are the branches I'm going to use in the design, okay? When we're we're creating this alpine form, right? And so that's kind of the the feel I was thinking for the tree. And so when we're looking at this, it's like, we may not, if this was like a very masculine tree, then maybe we would use all these, all this foliage in here, okay? All this foliage, use this, use this, and then you could have a really, really wide pad, okay? But this is an alpine tree that I'm going for. So it's like, we'll make smaller pads. There'll be more of them, but we'll have smaller pads, okay? So then, with pre-flush pruning, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and here's the pad after, okay? So a smaller pad. But what I did is with pre-flush pruning, what, what you're doing is we removed, so if we look here and we look here, all right? So we kind of have a snapshot of what we're looking at here. So we re I removed from this intersection here on out and I removed this intersection here on out. What was okay. your thought process behind that, Todd? Yeah, so I didn't want um, the branch to be too long. And I just wanted like this smaller, this smaller branch size. And so that's, that was it. But also when you're thinking about pre-flush pre pruning and, and what are you trying to like accomplish and what foliage are you gonna use? And so part of it is like these buds here, although weak, or all these little branches here, although weak, they have buds on them, right? There's a bud here, there's a bud here, there's buds on all these all these branches, okay? And so those were the branches I chose. That's like more what I was getting at, was some of your decision-making for that design based around health and vigor of certain portions of that branch. Sure. And that's why you cut it in certain places versus just another, you know, step down. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's like, where where is there good... Um, like good good buds on on the tips. There's not necessarily. I don't necessarily need buds like further in. I just need them on the tips. So with blue spruce though, like blue spruce and Engelmann's, if I have a branch like this branch here, and maybe it doesn't have a bud on the tip, but the foliage is really good. When I remove this portion, this portion, I cut back to this and I leave this, it will sometimes push buds on this. So like Douglas firs, I found do not. Um, but spruces, a lot of the time will set buds on, on branches that have good foliage, but not a bud on the tip, okay? So, but to set this up and to have like enough strength in the tree to really utilize this because right now, like, well, why am I even doing this? Why am I even like doing pre-flush pruning in the first place? 
Is that question rhetorical or are you looking for an answer? I'm looking for an answer. <laughs> I don't know. What Transition right. energy. No, why am I? Yeah, to distribute energy, right? Yes. And so what I'm doing is like this tree has all this energy, but it, I set it up because last year, right in the fall, um, I fertilized this tree like all fall. So if you're not going to, one, if you're not going to fertilize your trees at all, except one time of the year, it's better to do it in the fall. The second thing is I knew I was going to do work like this on this tree. And I'll show you at the end, some of the other trees that I did this work on last year. Um, but by fertilizing in the fall, you set the tree up. So in the spring, you're able to do this work and get a good, a good response, right? So it's like fall fertilization is the most important time to fertilize any, any of our trees, okay? Fall fertilization is the most important time to fertilize our trees, okay? Especially too, because here we have long winters, we have cold winters, and so it, it, it helps them. But if you're gonna do work like this, you need to fertilize in the fall. I can't say that enough. Okay, so what I'm doing here is by picking these branches, removing all this foliage out here. Can you see my hand, like the little hand thing here? Yeah. Okay, yep. I just wanna make sure. <clears throat> um, by removing all this foliage, I can take all the energy that was gonna be put in these extra, extra branches there, extra branches here, and I can distribute it into these, uh, <clears throat> into the branches closer in. So I can take all that energy that was in that big pad and I can put it here and, and tell, like I kind of direct the tree, where do I want the energy to go, right? So we have like a little weak branch here, right? And it's in a crotch and it's like, well, that may not be, you know, like it, it's kind of a structural flaw, but it has a butt on it. So it's like, oh, I'll leave it, you know? And it's like, we can grow that out. We can remove it, but we're just going to use it for the health of the tree. Okay. So I'm cutting back, like it says on the left, cutting back to finer interior growth, but I'm also, you know, kind of helping guide where I want the energy to, of the tree to go. Okay. Any questions on that? Or does that make sense? Yeah. Makes, Makes sense. sense. Good. So here's another branch. Okay. So this branch too, same thing. It's, it's kind of long. It's like, all right, what, I don't need this really long, long branch. I need a, a finer, smaller branch, you know, since we're going for Alpine. Again, if this was a very like short, stout, you know, masculine tree, I could use this whole, I could use this whole area here for a pad and make a really nice wide pad, but we're going for an alpine feel. So I need a smaller pad. Okay. And so here's that pad smaller, but we have like here, we have buds. I picked in this right here, right? There's nothing on there, but at the tip, there's a bud. Okay. And then here, this was a really long branch that right there was probably out in here. Let me see. Uh, where did that go? So that could have been over in here. Oh, maybe that's in here. I was trying to follow that. Regardless. But here we transition into a smaller branch because this was is too wide, right? Or maybe the branch is really long and there's not a good bud until the end, right? So it's like smaller, smaller branches, okay? So that's what I'm trying to do. But all these, like these now will really push and all these buds will get really, they'll get um, invigorated. And if there's any like latent buds or smaller buds in the, in the, in further in on the branch, they're gonna push and they're gonna swell and the energy is gonna go into them. Okay, so it's like just it's directing directing energy. Okay, so that's what what I'm trying to accomplish with this. And so that's another thing too when we're talking about this pre flush pruning. It's like, well, yeah, what are you trying to accomplish, right? It's like, are you trying to take something that's wider and bring it in so it's a little smaller, like a whole tree? Like I'm not doing this on a well ramified tree, right? I'm doing this on trees that are fairly overgrown that need 
to be like harnessed in. So trees that are well ramified, whether it's spruce or firs or redwoods or whatever, it's like, I'm not doing this on them. On them, I'm, I'm just, I'd be, I'll be pinching. But this is for like, after you let a tree grow and it gets out, you know, and then pushing it back and, and letting it, letting it um, put its energy into these smaller, smaller areas, okay? So here's the final result of that tree, okay? After we did all the work. So it's more alpine, smaller branches, you know, but we went from this left side, which is this really, you know, a really big overgrown symmetrical tree to something that has a little more asymmetry to it, smaller pads, more alpine. Um, and so this is something like over time, you know, some of these branches will be removed, but instead of it putting the foliage mass into this big area and all these buds, now it just has this, okay? Hey, Todd, we've, got a, we've got a question yeah. on um, timing and wondering if it's too late to perform this on a tree where the buds are swelling. If the buds are swelling, it's not. Okay. If the buds have already pushed out, then you're, you're a little late. Okay. And so, yeah, it kind of depends on, on where you are. Here, like here, trees that I had in my greenhouse, are they're pushing already. So it's like, all right, they're ahead of everything. But trees that I had outside that were on the ground, they're not pushing yet, okay? Like Tom, where you are up in Boulder, like where are your trees? Because uh, you have that cold frame also. So it's like, are your trees pushing right now or what's their state? Well, uh, I have uh, several uh, spruces, for example, in the greenhouse and they've, you know, they've, they've pushed. I sure. mean, they're, they've got new growth coming out. In fact, I didn't even uh, catch them in time to do any pinching. So I'm probably going to have to prune later on mm -hmm. after, you know, after those new uh, shoots uh, harden off, you know, perhaps in, in the fall uh, or later summer. Uh -huh. uh, but, um, but pines that are in the, uh, in the cold frame, uh, you know, they've got buds, but they haven't really pushed yet. I mean, they haven't really, you know, come out yet, mm -hmm. except for the ones that I, well, I keep the pinions in the greenhouse. Right. And, and those are, uh, uh, those, I've been pinching those recently. Yeah. Because they're, they're growing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Yeah, because like this spruce, so this spruce that's right behind me. <clears throat> oh, wait, your screen, not camera. I'll show you that afterwards. But I have a spruce behind me and it, it was in my greenhouse, but it hasn't pushed yet. Okay, so it's still, it, there's still that opportunity to do, do pre-flush pruning. But that's the thing, like right now, you're probably near the end of it. But last year when COVID hit, it's like, I was, I don't know, it was like the beginning of March. COVID hits and all of a sudden I'm home and it's like, oh my goodness, I get to repot trees. I, I didn't think I was going to get to repot. And I got to do work on trees that I had I had, you know, controlled, what is it? I, I had neglected, oh, what was my term? I just had a term and I forgot it earlier. Controlled, controlled neglect. neglect. Yes, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Benign, benign neglect. neglect. Um, but I was now able, it's like, oh, I have time. And it's at the perfect, <clears throat> excuse me, it's at the perfect time to do this work, okay? So anyway, so here's the work. This was after the tree was done, okay? And so now, after I do work like this, I fertilize it also. So it's like, okay, it's getting ready to push and I'm just gonna even pump, I'm gonna pump it even with even more energy. So after I do all this pre-flush pruning on all my trees, I fertilize them, okay? Todd, so then- What kind of fertilizer are you using right now uh, after this pre-flush prune? Yeah, so either, it depends. If it's like a show tree of mine that I, um, that I really, like all my really good, good trees, I, I give them bio gold, okay? Um, 
So bio gold, it, regardless, it's like, as long as it's an organic, it doesn't really matter. So I give them bio gold. There's also like Dr. Earth Life and there's also Dr. Earth. What is this one? I have one right here. Uh, premium, premium gold. So the Dr. Earth Life and the Dr. Earth Premium Gold, they're both nitrogen based or alfalfa based. So it's, it's better for the nitrogen. Whereas Dr. Earth, the previous versions of Dr. Earth were bat guano based. Now it's alfalfa based. Okay. So you get, you get more nitrogen. But after I do any of this pre-flush pruning, because I'm trying to like direct the energy, I'm trying to push it into certain areas. Um, and a lot of those areas may have been like covered up by other branches. They may be buds on them, but, but they may be a little weaker. So I just pump them full of energy, right? And I just let them, let them go. Because what you can do, like after you do this work, then the next, the next thing, the tree's going to grow. So as I look at all these pads, last year on all the trees I did, I didn't, I didn't touch them until like they let the growth push and then harden off. Okay, so that's one thing too. Like when you're done with this, if, if a tree just explodes and grows vigorously, you could probably pinch them. But I, I don't know, I was a little playing a, a little more conservative, so I just let them grow. Okay, and then once they harden off, and that's something that'll come up, right, in the next couple months, once it hardens off, then I pruned them, I pruned them back. Okay, so here's, so this is a Douglas fir. Okay, and on the left is before, and that was in like March. And then this, the one on the right was three days later. But like this one, it's going to take me two days to wire it. And so like a lot of times I didn't have the two days. So I, when I was home and this tree, so the history on this tree, um, I collected it and then I did the initial styling with Ryan at Mirai. I bring it back, we, re or we repotted it the next year. I bring it back and then that was when we got that hailstorm in 2017. And so there were branches, like I was in New Mexico actually at the moment and the alarm on my house is going off and it's like, I call the alarm company. They're like, yeah, it's a horrible hailstorm. And so it's like, all right. So I come home three days later and I'm looking at my trees and, and that tree I was looking and it's like the color's off and the branches look weird. And so I go in and there were branches on that tree that had been knocked off by the hail and they were hanging there by 10 gauge wire. And so like, it was really discouraging. So I just kind of let the tree go, okay? But then last year I'd been fertilizing it to try to get it to grow, try to, you know, let it build up some more of the like interior growth and branching. And then last year I did I did the, the work on this and it's like, okay, the tree, the tree gave back a lot, you know? And so that's the thing too. If you're on top of your fertilizer, if you're on top of, um, you know, getting your tree healthy, the trees give back a lot. And so this was the result after letting it go for three years. Okay. And so still it's like, it has, you can see the, you can see what's there in, in this, the shaggy picture, you know, but then anyway, but the right, that's, so that's pre-flush, right? Same thing, the same scope of work. This was probably the end of, the end of March was when I did this last year, okay? And so here's another one. This is a Colorado blue spruce. Same thing, let it go for a couple years. And then last year I did this pre-flush uh, pruning, okay? So a lot of times too, when I'm doing that pruning, but I'm also like, I'm basically rewiring the whole tree because any damage we do, any like structural moves that we wanna correct, the tree is getting ready to push a bunch of energy, right? So any of those tears, micro tears, any damage we do to the tree right now is a good time to be doing this because the tree will be able to heal it, right? If we do it too late in the year and the tree like is going into dormancy, depending on when we do it, um, the tree won't necessarily like compartmentalize or heal those wounds. Okay. So again, this is like this time right now, there's so much going on that, that we can like take advantage of. And, um, 
and do do the work on our trees, right? But then like we're getting this point where the buds will push and then we kind of have to be hands off because if we're working on the trees, then we're gonna be like knocking off buds or injuring, you know, the needles and things like that, okay? So this was a Colorado blue spruce. Same thing, after I did the work, then I, um, I fertilized this heavily, okay? So this was a juniper and this is like pre-flush pruning, but also for junipers in the late winter, I just kind of added this in there. Late winter is a good time to do big structural stuff on junipers. And so that's kind of uh, why I added that. This, is, this isn't my tree, actually. This is a tree in, uh, I don't know, it's in Knoxville, Knoxville that I did, okay? And then here's a Douglas fir. I did the same thing. So this tree, Part of my motivation, this tree in 2012, if you remember, Mark Nolander did a demo on this tree mm. at the ABS BCI um, show that we had at the Marriott. Ryan was there. Uh, Mark Nolander was there. The two headliners. Um, yeah, I remember that. Patrick Tico, I believe, connected this. And then Mike Blanton, like when they did the auction, he won it, okay? He won this tree. And then what happened was he didn't want me to ship it. He was like, here, can you hold a tree? And then he's like, I don't want you to ship it. Can you just send me some other trees for it? So I sent him a couple trees I'd collected for this, okay? So, but with this tree, this Douglas fir, I potted it maybe a year after, two years after, and it just didn't grow. And it didn't set like really good buds. And so I just fertilized it for like two or three years. And then this is the, on the left here, this is what it finally turned into. And it's like, all right, I've been pumping this full of, you know, energy and um, full of like fertilizer for a couple of years. Now I'm going to, I'm going to do the work and just see, right? And so what happened after I did that was it's still, and it's right Maybe I'll put it up afterwards because I brought it into the into the workshop here. So it's here, but still it's like with Douglas firs, they're also fairly touchy. And they're like, if they don't set, like blue spruces are pretty, you know, you can kind of determine like, if you do this, they're gonna do this, right? Doug firs, they're not always like that other than if they don't set a bud on a branch, they normally shed. So, so they like to shed branches and one thing I learned with them too, it's, it's like when you do initial styling on Douglas firs, um, I'm always prepared to lose some of the foliage because like if there's not a bud on it, I'll still wire it for aesthetics, but it'll still, it'll shed those, it'll shed branches that it doesn't have buds on. Okay. But then it'll push other branches. So I just know my initial styling on a, on a Doug fir, it's going to change. Okay. So anyway, so part of the reason I did the work at that time on this tree was to, to help direct energy into what was there and not just have this huge foliage mass. It's like, take some of that foliage away, do it at the right time, but then afterwards, like in all last year, I just pumped it full of fertilizer, okay? To try to get like whatever growth um, that emerged and I just let it go unchecked, right? So just, just let the, the foliage emerge. So one other thing with Douglas firs that are interesting is that they have something called juvenile buds. I don't know if, if you've heard that term or not. And so they'll set buds like along the branch. And if you don't do anything to that, they don't mature this year. They mature next year and then they push the following year. So two years. They'll, they'll push butts. Whereas on Douglas firs, if you, if you find a juvenile bud and you cut back to it, like once the new growth is hardened off, which would be out here probably July, end of July, uh, probably in, in July sometime, maybe in July sometimes, we'll say that. Um, but if you, if you do that, so, but one way to tell, it's like before the buds turn brown, when the buds are still red, you can trim them back. Once they turn brown, they're kind of past that stage. It's this little nuancey thing with them. But if you find that you prune them back at that time, then the, the buds will mature this year and push next year. Okay. So that's one of the things 
one of the little things with Douglas firs. So you can pinch Douglas firs or you can prune them back. Like Tom was saying, he missed, he thinks his timing for the blue spruce, the pinch. Um, so he's gonna come back in and prune them, okay? So here's some examples of like pre-flush pruning. Um, and so that's kind of like an overview of like what it is, what you're trying to get done. And then like these here are, are like the results of the before and after. Right. Huh? Yeah. All right, someone's, someone's not muted. And, you know, hey that, Todd. Um, no, we got a couple of questions for you. Oh, sure. One of them was uh, asking about that original blue spruce that you had. It looked like there was a uh, some kind of trunk scar. This one? Um, Actually, uh, David, uh, uh, it's my question. Uh, Todd, go back a little bit earlier. So that's the first tree that you were showing how to thin out the pads. Oh, this yeah, one? That, that, yep, right, right there. Uh, originally, uh, after some benign neglect or controlled neglect. Controlled. Is, yeah, there, uh, it appears to be a scar where there was a major branch removed and then uh, it's colored in or calloused over on the right side. I was just wondering how you did that and what you this used. This right here? Yeah. No, so that is from a porcupine. It's from a porcupine. I don't understand that. Yeah, so where these trees come from, there's porcupines that are in there and porcupines over the winter will come in and they'll, they'll eat at these spruce and oh. to get the sap because it's nutritious. Um, and so then they'll keep going back and eating that. So that's what that is. It is oh. here. And so if we go back to the beginning, let's see if it's, yeah. So this right here. Yeah. That's from a porcupine. Okay. When you said the word, I thought it, there must be some bonsai term that I hadn't heard before, but you mean a real porcupine. <laughs> no, it's, it's like an actual porcupine. Okay. Thanks. And that answers. And then, so what would you do with that? How did that get to be uh, darker? I just actually, color it? I, I didn't do anything. All I did was when I was done, I just took a toothbrush and I scrubbed it. I got it wet and scrubbed it just to clean it out. That's all I did. Cause the other, what was all like that white, um, the, the white on and kind of the grayish, it was just like dirt and sap. So I just cleaned it up. That's all I did. Got it. Okay. And second question real quick, would you treat a Norwegian spruce like the Colorado blue? With respect to this pre-flush regimen, yeah, I would. Okay, thanks. I would, I would, I would treat all spruces. Mm -hmm. Okay. With this same, with this same technique. So, like, really, the only thing I wouldn't, I say that, and I still like do work on it, but like long needle, single flush pines, or um, like multi-flush pines, like black pines, you don't want to do this too, right? Um, mm -hmm. Ponderosas, you sometimes like you you want to style a tree and it's like okay if you do it with ponderosa you just know you're going to get extra long needles that year right limber pines like their needles will get a little longer so so single flush long needle single flush pines it's not the ideal time to do like you could design them but to do like pre-flush pruning is not what those what is best for those trees right, right so limber right. pines um, in like the end of June, probably the end of June, July too, out here, you'll see, or white pines in general, you'll see like the sheath drop off where the needles are emerging. And you have like just these sheath every, like the, it's kind of this tannish clear, you know, sheath that are holding the, holding the needles. Once that drops, then that is a good time to come in and prune, right? Yeah, those are, those are the vesicles, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. So, so yeah, those are like the things, but like deciduous, you can do this too. Um, and like I said in the beginning, like the conifers, um, like that list of conifers, it's, it's all like, it's all a, a good time to do that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Todd, is that Irish moss growing in the pot? And do you try to get rid of that? I do. It is. I do. Um, it's, yeah, so yeah, if like for moss like that, it's like it looks nice until you like get up close and you understand what it is. So like with that, I'll pull it and it always comes back. And so like sometimes I'll just take uh, full strength vinegar 
and I'll spray it with vinegar. Not, I won't soak it with like the whole tree or root pad with vinegar, but I'll just spray it on, on the top of that and that'll, that'll kill it. So vinegar is, cause I don't want to go like get some weed killer and throw it on like any weeds in my trees because like a couple years ago, I did a test where I got some weed killer and then I sprayed it on like Siberian elm seedlings that were growing in cracks and stuff and the seedlings got all distorted. Um, so it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not putting that in my tree. So I'll either, you either pull all the weeds or I'll take vinegar and I'll spray uh, vinegar on it because vinegar is a natural, it's like a, a natural weed killer, so. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so once we're done with pre-flush pruning, with this, so usually what I do is I don't touch them afterwards and I'll just let them grow, okay? But then this year, like this year, I'm all these trees, I'm gonna pinch them. This year, I'm gonna pinch them. I'm not gonna let them grow out and then like, trim back after like that that first flush of growth is hardened off like from now on all these trees i'm going to pinch them okay there's <clears throat> but you also have to like i say that but there's also like situations on each of these branches as the new growth emerges it's like okay when you pinch trees like what do you pinch to do you just take a half off or do you just take a third off or what do you do Anyone? Does anyone know? How I'd much? Third. The branch. What's oh, that? That's a third. It depends on the strength of the branch. Sure. So, and it's like to the silhouette, right? So if we have this silhouette of this nice branch, it's like maybe some branches are shorter, maybe some branches are longer. So the longer branches, maybe we have to take off like all but maybe one whirl of needles where some maybe we have to take off a half or a third, or maybe we don't touch it at all. So within, like within these trees, as we're developing them, it's like each pad we have to look at and we have to analyze and we have to see, it's like, do I pinch it? Do I let it grow out? Do I prune it? Do I do like both of those or do I not touch it at all, right? So there's no like cut and dry, even with like these developed ramified trees, it's like, you don't rarely do, will I go in and I'll pinch everything because within each of those branches, we have to look and see, you know, what is the strength of the branch and what do I need the branch to accomplish, okay? Okay, so when I'm pinching, oh, here's one more. This is another duck fur, same thing. I, I don't know, I hadn't wired that in like three years, four years. I just, I just let it grow and it didn't like, it didn't, from that hailstorm, this one wasn't as affected as badly, but it's, I don't know, I just had to, I just let it grow. So too, after like I do initial stylings, I rarely touch a tree the next year, you know? So sometimes I wait like a year, two years. And part of that is like at Ryan's, he has some junipers there that he hadn't touched in four or five years. And they're just really, really shaggy, but he's, all he's doing is like, he's building this infrastructure inside you know, and then when you go to do that work, all of a sudden you have all these options. It's like the tree does a lot of work for you, okay? So this tree too, same thing, pre-flush pruning. And like that was the beauty of being home last year. I was able to do all this work um, and, and the timing was right, you know? So it's like <clears throat> fertilized in the fall, fertilized the following year, but really fertilized in the fall to set the tree up unbeknownst to me that I was going to actually be home. And then when I was able to do that work, the tree had all this, all this to give. And so after this, same thing, fertilized, fertilized again. Okay. Didn't touch the tree the whole year, just kept fertilizing it. And then now like this spring, um, I'll pinch, I'll, I'll pinch this tree. Okay. I'll pinch, I'll pinch what I can, but like if there's areas in it that are weak, I may let it grow and cut back, or there may be some areas where I, where I don't touch it at all, but <clears throat> but um, I will look to will look to pinch these trees. So when I pinch them, so here, like this is a blue spruce. So right here, right, this is about what the tree just about looks like. 
maybe over here too, like right here. Right here, we're almost at the end of where we wanna do it. But this is what I'm looking for when I'm, when I'm getting ready to pinch, okay? This is for Douglas firs too, right? Douglas firs, they have a little more look to them, a little more like this, but that's, this is kind of what I'm looking for when I pinch, okay? Okay. So here's just another picture, right? Here's the before and then pinching, just make sure you hold it. So, but if you let a, uh, a branch elongate and Tom was talking about, you know, it's like, I missed the time to pinch, I'm gonna probably have to go back in and prune. So on the left, this is that branch. This is a branch that I had done. There were no buds in here, right? Except for there was a strong, strong terminal branches. And so what I did is I went, you cut it back and you don't always get um, buds on this year growth. And this is for like spruces fairly specific, but you get buds where last year and, uh, and this year meet, okay? Okay, does that make sense? So Todd, when you, I mean, I'm looking at those two pictures on the left, where would you be printing that one long? You would be printing it about halfway down. Yeah, so see like this pad, this branch right here. Right. And it's like, if I'm trying to make a silhouette with this, then I would keep that right within, within the silhouette. So I'd probably prune, like I pruned it probably right around maybe in here. Okay. And you would you you might get a bud at the very end, but more likely you would get it back down where it looks like the growth was up until uh, the new growth came from last year. Yeah. So if you do the timing right, um, like here in June or July, a lot of times when you make that cut, you'll get a bud at the cut site. Okay. okay. You'll get a cut. Uh, you'll get a bud at the cut site. But if you don't for whatever, because sometimes you don't get it, um, then what you'll do is you'll get two buds. You'll, you'll get two buds. And almost always, like if you make that cut, you'll get two buds here regardless. So you'll okay. get one here and you'll get two back here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is like, this is something like moving forward like after the pre-flush, once it grows, this is something like that's going to be coming up that we need to be like you, you you need to be paying attention, okay? Or just know know it's coming. And for like people that have their spruces in in a greenhouse, it's coming it's coming sooner than you think, right? So, so the the ideal time is when the needles look like they're still kind of balled together. Still, they haven't quite spread apart. For what? Yeah, to for pruning or for pinching? the pinching for pinching. Sorry, yeah, so pinching. It still looks like a little pom pom almost. Yeah, so it, it looks like a paintbrush. Yeah. Okay. Like that's what I learned from Harold. Harold Sasaki, like when he was teaching me about stuff like this years and years ago, he always said it looks like a paintbrush, and so that's that's when I know that I need to pinch. That's like a good ideal time to do it. If you wait too long when it starts to, if you wait like too soon, then you can't get your fingers in there to pinch it out. And if you wait too long, then it becomes, it's still soft, but it's not as like pliable and you're not able to, to break the bud off, okay? So when I'm bringing like deciduous trees out from my greenhouse, what I'm doing is I'm trying, I'm putting them in the shadiest part of, of my backyard to where they get a little morning sun, but like they're protected from the heat. Right. The best thing you could do is if you brought them out and you had like three days of like overcast weather, which here in Colorado, we, we don't get three days, for right. long, you know? So it's like, that's a little hard, but so to me, like the way to compensate, because I used to like all my deciduous trees I kept here this year, whereas in the past I'd kept them, at Charlie Sisk's place and his greenhouse. And then I would bring them home. And if they even saw like the smallest amount of, cause Charlie has, his greenhouse is pretty shaded. If they even saw any direct sunlight, they just burned. Hmm. 
So having it in my greenhouse and I was like, I'm going to do a little test with this and just see. And so I brought them out, put them in the sun, in the shadiest portion where they get a little, they get morning sun still dappled, but too, at this time of year, it's not that bad. Right. Um, you know, cause like the sun's not as high, the heat's not as much, you know? So I was able to kind of transition them a little more mm-hmm. and, um, and just get it. So it's like, so their cuticles built up. And so that's one thing too. Um, I think Kevin, were you the one that you were asking about the deciduous? Yeah. So Kevin, um, like when they're in the greenhouse, they don't have like, maybe you have fans, but they still don't have the same amount of air movement. They still don't have the same amount of water movement, which causes um, the cuticle to form, right? So that's why, that's why moving it from a greenhouse outside, regardless, it's like the, the conditions outside of a greenhouse are, are more severe than they are in the, you know, regardless of how, how nice of a day we have. So that's where, you know, where that, where that transition needs to come in and where it can get a little touchy, but I don't think, so I brought trees out from the greenhouse and they were growing uh, conifers and I didn't, I didn't see any adverse effect at this time of year. I think maybe later on, like maybe in a couple of weeks, if they're still in a greenhouse and I brought it out and the heat, it's a little hotter, right? We're still in the seventies. Maybe we hit the eighties, but it's still a uh, cooler situation. Um, if you can get them out at that time, I think you'll, you'll be okay. So. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, how warm are your guys' greenhouses during, like, the winter? Yeah, sure. So, my greenhouse, um, so I have, in my greenhouse, I have, like, it's kind of, it's, there's different, different, like, areas. So, trees that are on the ground get colder, right? I have a heater, and I'll put, like, I have azaleas in there, and, um, azaleas, olives, things that are a little touchier. They're like basically right, like the heaters here, here's my azaleas, right? So they stay warmer. It's up higher too, because I have two different levels. I also have heat beds in there. Um, So, but when here, when it got down to in February, negative 11, I think it got down to, in the coldest part of my greenhouse, it got down to 19, okay? My azaleas did not get down to 19 or else they'd, they'd be dead. So my greenhouse, I, I have a cold greenhouse. Like in, in my greenhouse too, it's like azaleas, azaleas, Japanese maples, right? So it's more sensitive stuff. Um, I don't think any of those froze. Trees that are on the ground froze. Trees that were away from my greenhouse, it'll get down into the probably mid-20s. Um, I don't have things mulched in in there, so I I don't want it to get down below, ideally below 20, because I don't have like any sort of like insulation, there's not snow on top, you know, anything like that. So, so I have a cold greenhouse, but I have some areas where I'm able to set a little more temperature, temperate trees to where they can survive, um, survive those cold conditions. And then how warm can it get since uh, we often have warm days in the winter? Yeah, so let's say it's, I don't know, like, okay, let's say it gets up to 50, then maybe in my greenhouse it's uh, 60, maybe like 10 degree difference because I have louvers on the sides and then like a, a fan in the back in the top pulling all that cool air from the bottom up through the top, sucking all that, that warm air, air out. So let's say it's 40 and sunny, maybe in the greenhouse it's, because of the, the air it's pulling in, maybe it's in, you know, the upper 40s, maybe low 50s, maybe 53. So maybe a 10 to 15 degree difference in temperature. So. My greenhouse is a little different. It's a it's a bit warmer than that yeah. because it, uh, um, in, in the middle of winter, it seldom gets below 38 degrees or so in there. It never yeah. goes below freezing. Yeah, you have more temperate kind of, yeah, bougainvilleas and all sorts of different right. tropicals. And, and it, has, it has vents that open up if it gets to be 70 degrees outside. But it's amazing. I mean, it can be 25 degrees outside. It'll be 
65 to 70 degrees inside. I mean, yeah. it's just, if the sun is shining, if yeah. the sun is, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, so here, Colin. So uh, best time to candle black pines and white pines. So out here I do black pines um, between like June 1st and June 15th. Like that's kind of my, my timing on that. Um, when the needles are like starting to, when they're emerging from that candle, but as a timeline, it's kind of June, June 1st to 15th. And then like any like white pines, like once that, that sheath drops, that's when, that's when I, I prune. So rarely, like I don't pinch candles on white pines. A, I don't have white pines, but if we're going to talk about like white pines I, that I've worked on or even limber pines, it's like, I don't pinch limber pines. I let them grow out and then I prune back once that sheath has dropped. So, yeah. I don't know. Are there other questions, Steve? Same for pinion. So pinions, I pinch. I pinch when it's elongated. So if once our like if if it if the heat really kicks in, and like maybe my pinion pines right now the. The buds are maybe a half an inch, maybe a quarter inch, but it's like once that heat kicks in and those buds really pin, it's like, I don't know, I'll get, depending on the tree. Um, but if like once those candles are kind of a inch long or something, I'll start pinching those. So, but yeah, it's like pinions are like this outlier and it's like, do you just let them? So one thing, I don't know, Tom can talk about this too, because he's done work. And this isn't like opinion. This is like pre-flush pruning kind of talk. But this is something if we want to talk about seasonal maintenance, and it's like what's coming with pinions, it's like pinching pinions. That's, I found that to be um, a good way to like control length on them versus pruning. But also like pinion pines will bud back. But if you also with pinion pines, they're really interesting because if you prune them, they'll set buds, but then they'll push juvenile growth, which is this really bright, fluorescent, blue, thick, coarse needles. Yeah. And it's, it's, I don't know, they're, they're really, it's just, they're really an interesting tree that they do that. They're, they, they, they'll revert to juvenile foliage when like prune back or like work too hard late in the year, they'll push juvenile foliage for that year. But then the following year when they set buds, they'll push normal growth again. Yeah, it's interesting, Todd, because uh, two or three years ago, I had a conversation with Ryan about this. And at the time, um, we were both sort of wondering how pinions would respond and whether there was any possibility that they were multi-flush pines. Right. And I told Todd that uh, when I had treated them as multi-flush pines, they responded, you know, like you cut candles, but they would respond with juvenile foliage. Uh -huh. And so in the meantime, we sort of concluded that they really behave better as short needle single flush pines. Yeah. And so I've been pinching them and the pinching uh, I found actually stimulates back budding in the, yeah. pin in the pinions. So, yeah. 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 I think that is the, yeah, I found that too. It's like any time I overworked them or cut the candles as an experiment, it's like all of a sudden it just puts juvenile, yeah. juvenile buds in this crazy growth. So it's like, all right, that's not, I mean, too, like at times, if you're going to work pinion pines, it's like, maybe you do that once, maybe it sets those buds, it pushes juvenile, but with that juvenile growth, you get back budding, which then you can use as the, the foliage moving forward. So it's like yeah. this kind of one-time one-time thing with them where you're going to get juvenile, but then after that, the, the tree will revert back to a, to a pine. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful trees, actually. Any, yeah. May I ask a question regarding collective yes. pinions that kind of are in a stasis? Like they don't, they don't open the buds during the summer, uh, but obviously they are alive. And yeah. then I, I've had even the second year, the buds are still there and alive, but yeah. not opening up. Yeah. Should they be brought out in light? Should they be in shadow? Any ideas how to stimulate a movement? Yeah, I know, like I know, 
I think Tom and Andy Berry did a talk on pinions. Um, and I know like my, how I treat them is a little different from them. So when I like looking at pinions, where they're growing, they're in the desert, they're in full sun and they're just getting like hammered, right? So I take pinions and I put them, I put them in the sunniest, hottest place in my, in my, in my garden. That's what I do. They get tons of sun. They get, um, heat. But then they also like, depending on what did you, I don't know if you dug it, like if you got them from rock or if you got them after, out of the ground. From rock. Yeah. From rock. So, yeah. And that's interesting because like they'll run these really long tap roots. And so I've had a hard time collecting out of rock. I've had better success collecting them out of, um, out of the ground, but I probably just done that more. So if I were you, I would give them sun, but if they're struggling, First thing you got to do is watch, like with everything, watch like how, don't keep them too wet, right? So watch the water, make sure they, they dry out before they water again. But also like maybe if they're struggling, keep them out of the heat of the day and give them like, if you can give a morning sun. Yes. You know, give a morning sun maybe up to uh, like 11, 12, one, but then keep them out of the heat of the day. So anything that is struggling like that, that's, it's like pamper it a little. Once they go, because I had pinions here, I had a tree stolen. It was last year. It was a pinion. I had it on the edge of my bench, closest to the alley where they came in. But it was that that got the most sun and was the hottest. So one thing too, like with pinions, with any of the desert species, once you cut that taproot, they take water. So my pinion, when I brought it out, I always protected it. it uh, protected it. Um, I don't leave pinions out because they seem to be a little more sensitive. So I protect them in a greenhouse or I'll put them in my garage and open it so they get some sun. But um, I would bring all my trees out and all my other trees maybe got watered twice a day. My pinion I watered at times three times a day. It was granted, it was in a small pot, but pinions will take up a lot of water. That's Any I... desert species, once you cut that taproot and it stimulates those finer uh, those finer roots, feeder roots, like that, they will take up a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Thank you. That's my, yeah, that's, that's my, my uh, interaction with them. Pinions are great. They're great. I love, I love pinions. Last year in August, I did a demo for, with Adam Johnson and uh, Paul Koenig at the Botanic Gardens. And Larry had a pinion there that the gardens had. And I worked on that. And it's like, I just, I love them. I love pinions. I love pinions, so, yeah. Any other questions? Question about Doug Fur. Um, have you noticed a difference in procedure of like pinching to cutting back if it's from Colorado or? I heard from Colorado and then I lost you. Oh, sorry, um, collected from Colorado or Oregon or anywhere else. Uh, are, they, are they all created equal? in practice or in that way as far as or are they differing yeah so to be honest like pseudosuga menziesii right in the ones from colorado um like i know there's like doug furs in in oregon new mexico too i think uh down in new mexico yeah sorry just looked up yeah, so like furs in Oregon, I've never messed with, but they just like they appear to have longer needles, right? That's what I'm not. That's what I've noticed in mine because I brought most of my trees over from Oregon to Ohio, and yeah, they're doing, they're doing great with the humidity, but this year they pushed the most. They're mm -hmm. not like you know, two inch, two inch right. push. I was like, that's really big. Like you know, some back. Hassle. Yeah, I just didn't know if you'd run into, you know, especially yeah, with working at Ryan's place. To be honest, I haven't worked on any furs from Oregon or from that area. I've just worked on the the natives from here in Colorado, Understood. and then when I was in New Mexico, someone had some furs down there that they had gotten, and so I'd worked on them. But they were all from like the Rocky Mountains, Sandre de Cristo mountain range, you know. So they're all 
um, all from this area. So, but right. they do, they seem to have tighter, smaller foliage, mm -hmm. um, but how they act like root wise, I, I can't, I can't intelligently speak to that because I just haven't, I haven't had the, the interaction with them. So. Yeah. I was just wondering with the pinching technique because I'm doing more so this year because I let it regain health after being here for a couple of years. Just yeah. I mean, it, it should, my yeah. guess is it should, it should work out the same. So I have pin or yeah. I have Douglas firs, like some of those Douglas firs I showed that I did the pre struck or pre flush pruning on last year. I'm going to pinch all those this year. Okay, cool. Not, I say that I keep saying, I'm going to pinch them, pinch all of them. It's like, I'll assess everything. Right. Like I was saying, I that, yeah. Yeah. that will be my first course of action. If mm -hmm. there's a strong areas, I will pinch them. Okay. And then I'll, like analyze. And so that's the same thing it, with, or not the same thing, but with pinching, it's like not all of the growth is going to merge the same. Mm. So it's like the strong shoots will come out. It's like I'll pinch them first. And then maybe a couple days later, like the medium kind of strength and then the lesser strength. So it's like it's over a period of time. It's like you don't just pinch one tree in one day and it's like, okay, I'm done with that. It's like, no, this right. is going to be an ongoing process for for all, all, all trees that you pitch. Redwoods, right. you know, all of them, all of them. Right. So. Cool. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Any other okay. questions? Trees that you reported in, let's say, March and were in your greenhouse protected. Yeah. At what point of the summer would you think it's safe to start bringing them really out into a stronger sun? I mean, I would bring them out once I knew it wasn't going to freeze. Like, like a, for instance, a juniper, reported. Uh, monosperma juniper you yep. would just put it out in the full sun i wouldn't put it in full sun i would put it well yeah. no 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 that it depends so i have like we let me think about this okay i would not put it in full sun here in colorado in oregon you probably can you know or where you're where the elevation is a lower where uv the UV index is not quite as high, maybe. You could probably go put it in full sun here on all the repots. And like in the classes that we did, the repots were pretty severe. And so all of those trees, I put them in morning sun, but then once it hit maybe one or two, they're in shade, okay? But then once like you see new growth and the new shoots growing, then you could, you could either transition it out um, Yeah, you could transition it out. But once you feel like once the tree is growing, you know, and doing really well, then that that's when I would start transitioning it into into more sun. Junipers like and junipers and pine, just remember, like their wheelhouse is like upper 80, so, 90 degrees. It's like when you give them heat, it's like they just they run, you know, that's that's what they like. So something to think about with that. But at the same time, if it's um if the repotting was severe or, you know, regardless, I think, I think I would just out here in Colorado, I think I'd protect them. I'd protect them. I'd protect them. Yeah. Hey, Todd. Yeah. Uh, another thing to add to that is that, um, uh, I mean, we have such strong sun and, and, and where we live, it's even stronger because we're up higher. Yeah. Uh, but um, the other thing to think about is protecting the, the roots protecting the pot as mm -hmm. opposed to the foliage because a lot of trees, you know, can take a tremendous amount of sun and heat in the foliage, but you don't necessarily want the pot to be boiling either. So right. sometimes you can put the tree in a place where the pot is somewhat protected or shaded, mm -hmm. let's say, but the foliage is still exposed. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I don't, uh, Yeah. I haven't really paid, like, to be honest, too much attention to protecting the pot. It's kind of just the whole, the whole tree in general, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm, dude, it's I, like eating eat water. It's like, that's what roots like. Right. And that's like, that's why you take, you take trees and you put them on heat pads sometimes after repotting, you know, right. it's like the heat and too, like the time that we are repotting, um, and it's, you know, it's like the 60s to maybe 80s. It's like, I think having a tree 
in sun when it's 80 degrees, I, I think that could be okay. I, I understand what you're saying. That it is it is a good point because when it's like 100 degrees and right. the UV index is like 12 or whatever the maximum is, it's like it, those 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 trees get or those pots get really get really really hot. So right. I'm not I'm not super uh, sensitive to that either, but yeah. I know it's it can be a problem because sure. you know you put your hand on the pot and if the pot is really hot, yeah. it means the roots are hot. Yeah. Even if, I mean, so, and that can be ameliorated some, to some degree, as you know, Todd, by, by, uh, by just, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, spraying, you know, just, just misting, the, misting it, the, during the day. The yeah. No, and, and that's true. Like, there are some times where it's, when it's really hot last year, and I was home, and it's like, I didn't really water the trees, I watered the pots, just yeah. to, yeah. Like, every two hours, it's like, all right, I'm going to go because it's like two to five, it's 90 some degrees. I'm just going to water the pot just to okay. cool them down for a little cool bit. So, down, yeah. yeah, that's that's something I've, I've, I've done in the past. Dad, in, along the same line, yeah. uh, you mentioned earlier that you had some 50% shade cloth yeah. in, in the greenhouse, I think you said, yeah. um, and you've removed that. Do you use shade cloth uh, once the trees are out in the open? Uh, so I don't in the greenhouse. I just it's on the outside of the greenhouse, and so that's on all year round. So it's like okay. I'm, I think I'm four years into it. So it's like I'm gonna need new shade cloth eventually. So, but the reason it's on the outside, other than the inside, because once, even though it would shade the trees on the inside, once the sunlight gets through the panels like the greenhouse panels, yeah. like that's where heat comes from, mm -hmm. right? And so you're going to still get the heat, but you won't have like the amount of sunlight. Whereas if you put it on the outside, you still are getting the 50% shade, but you're not getting the same amount of heat. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But it, and I don't think I was clear. Well, I'm asking about shade cloth once the trees are outside of the greenhouse. I don't, I don't, I don't have. So last winter... Maybe it was December, November. I, I had a like 60 foot green ash that had like a nice, uh, it probably put too much shade on my backyard, but I cut it down. So now like everything's gonna get full sun. So that's something I have to adjust. Um, and so it's like looking and being like, okay, do I need to build shade structure? Especially like the more deciduous, there's still one area that has like a Siberian elm that's my neighbor's that gets filtered sun. So that's where I'm putting all my deciduous, but I'm gonna need to build some sort of sh shade structure. But after, if I, had sh if I had shade structure, then coming from the greenhouse to a shade structure would be, that'd be very beneficial, beneficial, but I don't have a shade structure yet. So I have to go according to where I am getting shade, you know? So at the moment, no, I don't, I don't have a shade structure and I don't, Okay, and hypothetically, if you did, yep. and I don't know where where you're growing your trees exactly, but I'm in a Denver neighborhood here. I'm in Denver. I'm by Sloan's Lake. Oh, that's where my kids live. Uh, what would be a good de good um, measurement or a good degree of uh, shade? Mm -hmm. 30, 50, 60, what? I just came in from Chicago last summer and I, I burnt up some trees <laughs> and I don't want to have that happen again. I mean, I think out here with deciduous, I think 50% shade. Okay. That's where, that's where I would start. I think 30%, I, I don't think 30% is enough. Mm -hmm. I think 50% is probably, I think 70% may be too much, yeah. but I think 50% would be, I feel pretty good about 50%. Okay, that's great advice, thank you. Thank so you. That's, that's, that's what I would start mm -hmm. with. Okay. Yeah. Todd, I, I hope you don't mind me jumping in like oh, this, fine. but, uh, we, you know, I keep all my deciduous trees and uh, any of the more sensitive trees on the north side of our house. Mm -hmm. And even then, uh, on benches on the north side of the house, and even then, I cover them in the, in the, in the heat of the summer with 50% shade cloth, yeah. and they do uh, just fine. Yeah. Um, but they're, you know, they get a little morning sun and then I 
pull that shade cloth over and uh, on some just frames that are made with yeah. PVC pipe and and they do great they do just great under that yeah keep the kusimono there too yeah the other the other advantage of shade cloth in colorado is yeah. it will help protect it from hail so yeah, exactly, exactly. Won't be hauling ass out in the middle yeah. of the afternoon try to get stuff out i know david didn't you get hail recently we've had three hailstorms so far this year or so yeah. um yes so here, I'll throw this out. And this is something I've been thinking because now that I cut that big ash down, I had like that helped with shade. You know, it's like ash. Um, there was a, you know, it's got a huge kind of like leaf mass that helped protect it. But it's like, okay, if I build a shade structure, do you first put down like a quarter inch screen or even like an eighth inch screen that is almost like a hail barrier, you know? So it's like, hail. Hey, oh, I'm serious. So hail would come hit that screen and like shatter, which would, it'd be like, I don't know. It's just, it's something I was thinking about like that garden mesh or that it's just that metal mesh you get at Home Depot, get a quarter inch and just make a shade structure and have that as a base. And you can put like shade uh, the, the screen on that. I don't know, but that's something for like, Oh, maybe I'll maybe I'll try that and just. Hey, I think it's a I think it's a great a great idea. I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah, the hail could be pretty intense here. I've heard. I mean, like you said, like with that with that Doug fir, like there were branches hanging by ten gauge copper wire that were broken off from the hail. So it's it can it can get like golf ball golf ball size marble size. It can get really bad here. So that's what I was thinking with a hail barrier, quarter inch. It's like. All right, or eighth and whatever. It's like the big hail that hits it, it just splits apart and you know, it's like damage will be minimal. So something, something to think about out here, especially like David, because I saw that picture that, that he posted. It's like, geez, it's hail, hail already. It's like, oh. So anyway. Yeah. I don't know, is there any other questions or? Todd, why don't you uh, talk for a minute about the difference between multi-flush and single-flush pines? Because Yeah, so multi-flush, like coming up to this point, like two, you should be, like you need to fertilize, like black pines, we need to fertilize those, right? And so like fertilize them, and then six weeks, that's when I, I, I pull it off, six weeks before I say that before you cut the candles. So as the candles are growing, fertilize it, then you gotta pull them off, cut the candles here like June, uh, like June 1st to June 15th, right? And so cut the candles and then they kind of sit there and then they'll set a, a whole nother, like a whole nother set of buds. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five, you know, it, it depends, but then those will grow again. So, so multi-flush versus single flush, like all the spruces, firs, like all those are, it's like they're elongating species, but they're all single flush, right? They grow once and then they stop. Whereas multi-flush trees, they'll push, you trim them and then they'll push again, okay? So like the spruces, um, like even junipers, it's like they're not like a multi-flush, but junipers will grow all year round. Like not all year round, but they'll grow, like they don't just, um, they don't just stop, you know, growing it at one time or another. It's like you prune them and then they'll, they'll grow some more. So sometimes maybe you have to prune them twice with like ramified junipers. Um, like right now is actually not a bad time to prune junipers. So that's like ones that are ramified. But remember, remember when you do that, it's like for every action, there's a reaction. So if you're just pruning like elongating tips and stuff like that, you're fine. If you prune them back hard at this at this time of year, they're going to push juvenile, right? So it's mm -hmm. like junipers, you have to be very, it's this little delicate dance because yeah, for every like reaction, junipers will show you what you've done, right? If you push hard, like other trees won't, junipers will, okay? So, but yeah, that's, I, I get off topic. It's, it's like, we can talk about all this stuff forever. It's so much fun, but for, um, for yeah, like single flush, multi flush pines, um, they'll push red pines too. So it's like black pines, red pines, right? Um, 
I know there's some talk like loblolly pines if they're a multi flush. I haven't worked on loblolly, but like they'll push once you prove you cut them back while their needles are emerging, and then they'll set a, a second set of like smaller, kind of finer buds, which then you let grow out again, right? Because you want to take all that energy that is putting in the second in the the second kind of group of foliage, and like distribute that evenly through that. Okay, because if you cut, if it's if you have five little whorls growing from one spot and you cut two out, then you're going to get that long, long, long elongation, long internodes again, where it's like we want these to be tight. So you let all five of those grow and then come fall, then you prune them back. Right. But that's like fall pine work. That's a whole nother thing. So it's the same with like spruce. Let's say you have like a whirl of, of buds on a spruce. I don't go in and I don't like select buds on a spruce. Right. It's like you just let them all grow out because it's taking all that energy, putting it into those, to that wider foliage mass, and then you get you get that finer foliage, right? And then you can always come in and, and trim back. So I don't know, like, again, like the big takeaways right now, it's like watch out for fungus because fungus with the wet weather, even though it's arid here, the wet weather and the heat, that's fungus loves that. Fertilize everything right now. And if you still have time to do like a pre-flush pruning. Now is a great time. Here, let me too. Here. I'll bring this over just so you can see. Like this is a tree I've had for a long time. And I did the pre pre-flush pruning, but it's like look at all the buds that it, it set last year. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's just, it's set buds like at the crotches, you know, everywhere. And so that's right now too is a good time. Like if there's any, can you see my finger here? I'm not looking at my. Yes. Like where these two branches are here and these two buds in here, it's like, well, maybe those two come out and then I can wire these two, right? So this tree, even though it's like, it's as ramified as ramified it is and as full as it is, there's still, there's still like pre-flush work to do on this, although not as extreme as like going basically from a raw tree or a completely overgrown tree to a, to a design tree. It's like there's still smaller work, you know, that you can, you can apply with this pre-flush pruning too. It doesn't have to be drastic all the time. It can be little, little pieces of work as well, so. All right. Oh, Dave, are you muted? I am. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're kind of at the top of the hour, nine, almost nine o'clock. Sounds like we've run out of questions. So I wanted to thank you, Todd, for a really interesting uh, discussion. Yeah. And if thanks. it ever stops raining, I've got some ideas of things to do. Uh, <laughs> Build a workshop. That's true. I'm just, I'm tired of the winter. You know, yeah, I, I keep thinking, uh, okay, so now we're here, it's going to get warm, it's going to get sunny, and then it turns around on me. I'm just, I'm ready for a little summer. Yeah, I am too. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the questions. And uh...